Welcome everyone and good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Bavis-Lasky and I'm the Manager of Patient Programs, Research and Advocacy at Lymphoma Canada. I'm pleased to welcome you all today to the webinar on Lymphoma Research Highlights from ASH 2020, which is hosted by Lymphoma Canada. We appreciate so many of you joining us online today to learn a little bit more about new and exciting research on lymphoma from the 62nd American Society of Hematology meeting and exposition that was held virtually this past year in early December of 2020. Uh, before I go on to introduce today's speaker, there are just a couple of items to note. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Lymphoma Canada's website later today. You will also receive an email by the end of day today with a link to the recording to watch. If, you, if we do have, uh, we have left time at the end of this presentation for some questions. If you do have anything that you would like to ask, either during or following the presentation, you can type it into the questions box, which is located at the bottom of your control panel on the right hand side of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. I would now like to introduce and welcome today's speaker, Dr. Martina Trinkus. Dr. Trinkus is an assistant professor and staff hematologist at St. Michael's Hospital with the University of Toronto. She serves on many education-based committees and is currently the program director for the Adult Hematology Training Program and also coordinates the hematology curriculum at St. Michael's. Her medical interests include medical education with a research focus on mentorship and e-based learning. Dr. Trinkus was one of the conference chairs for this past year's 15th annual Care at ASH meeting, which brought together leading Canadian hematologists to address relevant issues in oncology and lymphoma and key news and data from the ASH symposium. Dr. Trinkus dedicates her work and research to the malignant lymphoma patient population. We're very excited to welcome her today to share with us the research highlights on non-Hodgkin lymphomas and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Before we begin, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all patients and caregivers who have responded to one or more of our e-surveys over the past year. As you may know, with the development of therapies for lymphoma and CLL patients, Lymphoma Canada advocates for equitable access to these new and innovative therapies in Canada by providing your experience with your lymphoma, existing therapies, and new therapies, you are helping to advocate for access to new treatment options for patients across the country. Thank you for your help and you can continue to access these surveys through our website. I would now like to turn over the presentation to Dr. Trinkus. Thank you very much. Um, thanks so much for the kind introduction and I hope you can all hear me today. I tend to talk very quickly, so, um, Please uh, feel free to interrupt me for any questions, and I'm, I hope that I can answer quite a few of them. Um, so today I'm going to be spot speaking about the ASH 2020 update in lymphoma in particular. And these are my disclosures. So the objectives for today are to briefly review the current standard of care, specifically in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and specifically I'll be speaking about follicular lymphoma and Waldenson's macroglobulinemia, and diffuse starch B-cell lymphoma. Uh, due to time limitations, I'm not able to also touch on Hodgkin's lymphoma. I will be speaking about some of the ASH 2000, uh, 2022 updates, and um, hopefully you can appreciate at the end of this talk future changes in clinical practice. I should mention that with ASH, there were over 6,000 abstracts submitted this year, 20% less than the year before due to the pandemic, but that did not limit the excellent research and clinical trials that are actually underway. Um, so I can only give you a handful today. I'm sorry about that. So I'm going to briefly speak about what lymphoma is, appreciating that there's probably a very big uh, population um, or a very big um, uh, breadth of knowledge for many of you, but some of you are just probably learning about this topic. Um, lymphoma is a cancer that develops from the immune system, and this includes uh, lymphoid tissue, so the lymph nodes in our body, the spleen and the bone marrow, and all of those cells that make our antibodies, which we call immunoglobulins. If these cancer cells at all spill into the peripheral circulation into our blood, we call it a leukemic phase of the lymphoma. And one of the more common lymphomas that we see uh, in this phase is called chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL. This is the frequency of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma subtypes in adults. 
The most common is diffuse large B cell lymphoma, followed by follicular lymphoma. And then I've listed some of the others based on this um, slide on your uh, right hand side. It should be noted that in Canada, about 9,000 cases of lymphoma are diagnosed per year. And uh, we are now picking up more and more cases of chronic lymphocytic leukemia because of the many screening blood tests done in older patient populations. And this is traditionally how CLL is picked up in 91% of Canadians. So I'm gonna start this uh, review based on uh, our knowledge of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, the average age of diagnosis is 72. The age adjusted incidence rates are about seven to 12 per 100,000. And we diagnose it through a very special test called flow cytometry of the blood. We're looking at specific B cell values of greater than five to instead of the nine per liter with a very specific immunophenotype. I just put a picture here so that you can see what we look at under the microscope. And they're tiny little lymphoid cells that have little soccer ball nuclei appearances. When we look at our patients with CLL, we often like to prognosticate them, but already the most updated prognostic scoring system called the CLL International Prognostic Scoring Index is outdated, being published in 2016 by Dr. Halleck and, and his German colleagues. What we look at with the CLL IPI are a few factors. We look at whether patients may have adverse cytogenetic features, such as housing the P53 or 17P deletion cytogenetic abnormality, if they have a thing called an unmutated IGHB status. And what this means is that your B cells, which are the cancers in this CLL uh, cancer, are not able to actually make antibodies normally. They're very rigid and fixed in their production of antibodies, meaning they're unmutated. We like to see mutated cells. And if you're unmutated, that also portends a slightly inferior prognosis. We look at a protein in the blood called the beta-2 microglobulin. We look at the clinical stage. Uh, in Canada, we traditionally use the RYE staging system, uh, whether it's uh, from zero to four. And then we also look at a patient's age, appreciating that the older a patient is, the more resistant the CLL clone may be, or the harder it may be to actually treat these patients. And then these patients are risk stratified from low, intermediate, high, or very high risk groups. And why is this important? Well, because back in 2016, looking at the data, we recognize that patients who are low risk CLL patients have a very long tenure overall survival of 79%. I think now that we have better agents to treat CLL, our tenure overall survival curves are going to be extended even longer. And very high risk patients had an overall survival at 10 years of only three and a half years. Again, now that we have more novel agents at our disposal, this survival is actually likely a gross underestimate. The things that we consider in treatment for our patients is whether in particular patients are 17P deletion as mentioned, and some trials have anywhere from three to 27% of patients newly diagnosed with CLL as having this deletion, and mutation of that IGHV status of which up to 50% of newly diagnosed CLL patients have this. However, we don't just treat patients based on their cytogenetic or mutation analyses. We really have to have an indication for treatment because some of these patients may not need treatment for several years. So we, you, we really have to think about whether patients have progressive marrow failure, meaning that they have a drop in blood counts that actually is affecting their overall quality of life, whether they have growth of lymph nodes or their spleen that is also compromising organ function, whether they have significant rises in their lymphocytes counts in the blood, whether they have other phenomena where their immune systems are actually attacking their red blood cells or platelets, and if they have any specific disease-related symptoms like weight loss, significant fatigue, fevers, or drenching night sweats where you have to change your sheets at nighttime, then we actually have to think about treating you for this condition. Treatment has evolved over the years. So in 1954, we actually had our hands on chlorambucil, which is a purine analog, it's a pill. And for certain subsets of patients, we still use it. But throughout the years, much of our treatment has been based on intravenous chemotherapies like bendamustine, fludarabine. And then in 1992, we finally had a monoclonal antibody called rituximab, 2004 ofatumumab, and then obinutuzumab in 2009. And these are specific med, uh, immunotherapies that actually target CD20 positive antigens on the outside of our B cells to actually kill them. 
Now, however, since 2013, we have targeted therapy. So this is not chemotherapy. These are pills that you take by mouth that actually target specific processes in the B cell to prevent their proliferation and to promote their cell killing or apoptosis. The other treatment that is now coming down the pipeline more and more is a CAR T cell therapy that I'll speak to later on in this presentation. Right now, however, the only cure for CLL is allogeneic bone marrow transplant. And because of our new therapies in CLL, uh, the last bone marrow transplant for CLL uh, was done uh, almost over one year ago. And I believe there's only one to two bone marrow transplants for CLL now done in Canada per year. It's very rare to do this. So I spoke about targeted agents in CLL, and for some of this, you, you, for some of you in the audience, this may be review, but it's important for the context of our discussion with CLL as we look into the landscape of this with ASH 2020. First off, we have a drug called idolalacid, which actually is a PI3 kinase inhibitor. We have another drug called ibrutinib, which is a Brunton tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And then we have another drug called venetoclax, which is a BCL2 inhibitor. And these are all fancy little, little um, uh, uh, drugs that actually inhibit B cell proliferation, growth and survival at different stages in B cell maturation. The important thing, however, is that these are all oral agents, they're targeted agents, but they all come with their unique toxicities that we'll talk about. Speaking about CLL specifically with chemotherapy, whenever we sit down with our patients, we have to be mindful of a few things. First off, we do have to respect where CLL therapy came from. Specifically, right now for first-line therapy, meaning you've never been treated for CLL before, we can consider certain chemotherapy, immunotherapy options. One of them is chlorambucil and a bit or a benetuzumab, a monoclonal protein with a, in a chemotherapy pill that overall gives a remission duration or control of disease of 27 months. But even though this progression-free survival is 27 months, we have to appreciate that in CLL, we don't actually retreat at the 27-month mark. The time to next treatment may be as long as 48 months on average with this. We can always manage patients with active surveillance, even if there are a few lymph nodes or a mild drop in your blood counts, so long as things don't get too out of hand. Another treatment that some of you may have heard about is fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab which gives a control of CLL disease for up to 52 months. And traditionally now, this is being reserved for patients under the age of 65 with good renal function with a mutated, not an unmutated IGHV uh, immunoglobulin status. And for those patients that do not have the 17P deletion clone. First line trials are summarized here in this table, and it's nice and busy for your perusal. Um, but it just goes to show that since 2015, these novel agents, these targeted agents have really taken over the landscape of CLL and have taught us a tremendous amount about how we can treat our patients and that we are actually making incredible headways with overall survival. The first of this is a brutinib and chlorambucil, which is the Resonate 1 trial. Ibrutinib, an oral Brunton tyrosine kinase inhibitor compared with chlorambucil, resulted in a two-year overall survival of 98% of patients versus 85% of patients. And this might not seem like a lot, but when you look at long-term data and maturation data, we are seeing incredible long-term survivals of patients on ibrutinib. This is a daily pill that's given once per day. However, what we are now noticing from this year's ASH is that there's an up to 42% discontinuation rate of this oral CLL pill at five years. And the majority of these discontinuations are due to adverse events or toxicities, making it imperative for us to understand how to properly put patients on good dosing of ibrutinib and managing toxicities. Another trial to highlight is this one by Dr. Shanefeld, published in 2018 of uh, ibrutinib and rituximab versus FCR. That's in lines three and four here. What we learned from this trial is that ibrutinib and rituximab is actually better for those who have unmutated IGHV status, which is why for those patients with unmutated status, we, do no, we no longer give FCR fludarabine cyclophosphamide and rituximab. Dr. Wojak uh, published in 2018 another trial comparing ibrutinib versus ibrutinib and rituximab versus bendamustine and rituximab. And what that trial showed us was that adding an immunotherapy to ibrutinib offered no benefit. 
so that we could actually sit, get away with our therapy without any intravenous drug. We could just give oral pill to our patients. Um, and finally, at the bottom here, I just wanted to highlight the Elevate TN trial, which compared a calibrutinib, uh, which is a competitor of a brutinib, but the same class of action versus obinutuzumab with a calibrutinib versus chlorambucil and obinutuzumab. And what we see here is that a calibrutinib has superior progression-free survivals over chlorambucil and obinutuzumab. And data here is still maturing. And I'll, I'll explain why this is actually really important for us as we navigate the landscape. But what it is telling us right now is, do we really need chemotherapy, meaning things like fludarabine, for frontline CLL? And really right now what we're recognizing is that chemotherapy should not be given to those who have high risk genetic features with their disease. Those who have IGHV unmutated disease or a P53 or 17P deletion uh, abnormality. We also should not give chemotherapy to patients who have very uh, significant comorbid medical conditions uh, like uncontrolled high blood pressure, uncontrolled heart disease, uh, uncontrolled conditions that may lend them to an increased risk of infection. The only time we should be giving chemotherapy really is for very fit patients with good kidney function who do have IGHV mutation uh, abnormalities. The other thing that we have to consider when we look at first-line therapy for CLL patients and even second-line are the toxicities that come with these oral pills. Specifically, we have to think about arthralgias, which can affect up to 25% of patients on a brutinib, atrial fibrillation or an irregular heart rhythm, which can affect up to 12 to 16% of patients on BTKI inhibitors, bleeding is a possibility, high blood pressure years down the road, and even infection. And what I want to highlight is that a calibrutinib, based on that Elevate TN trial, has half the number of toxicities of the traditional ibrutinib patients that we see in clinical trials. These two drugs have not been compared or published head to head yet, but there is a CLL17 trial currently underway that is comparing them in the front line. So hopefully we will get news on toxicities and overall differences and overall progression-free survival, overall survival in the next uh, couple of years. So a basic algorithm for first-line CLL treatment in Canada includes us looking at patients for their comorbidities, their physical fitness level, whether they have genomic instability or aberrations that portend a worse prognosis. And also some patients do want a fixed duration of drug. They don't want to be on a pill every single day and some patients frankly cannot be compliant with, with a drug every day. Essentially for patients under the age of 65 who are fit, who have a mutated IGHV status, we give still chemoimmunotherapy with FCR. However, if you have an unmutated IGHV status, and which occurs in 50% of patients, we typically put patients on ibrutinib or a calibrutinib, which in some jurisdictions is now given uh, compassionately. If you actually are over the age of 65 or you are unfit, having any comorbidities that increase the risk of chemotherapy, we look again as to whether you might have a mutated IGHV status, for which we might consider chlorambucil and obinutuzumab, which can actually put you off any therapy or a treatment-free interval for over three years, or a BTK inhibitor like a brutinib or a calibrutinib. But if you have an unmutated IGHV status, we would prefer preferentially put patients on a BTK inhibitor, such as a brutinib or a calibrutinib. For those patients who have a 17P deletion or P53 mutation, we traditionally are now uh, exclusively giving PTK inhibitors up front, but this too will be changing with the new drugs coming down the block. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is an update of the CLL14 trial data from ASH 2020. This originally was published in June 2019 by Dr. Fisher and her German colleagues, comparing venetoclac and abinutuzumab in patients with CLL and coexisting conditions. Essentially, this trial compared newly diagnosed CLL patients and randomized them to either an oral BCL2 inhibitor called venetoclax with abinutuzumab intravenously given uh, on an every 28 day basis for six cycles versus oral chlorambucil for 12 cycles, again, with obinutuzumab, the intravenous CD20 agent, and treatment was completed after 12 months or 12 cycles of therapy. What was identified with a 36 month, or, or what was identified was at 36 month, months, the progression-free survival, meaning complete control of CLL 
was 82% in the venetoclax pill group versus 50% in the chlorambucil group. The other things we learned in ASH 2020 is that we are now measuring a um, term called uh, MRD. And, um, and this is a term where we actually look at uh, molecular remission disease status for our patients, where we can actually take a blood or a bone, man, uh, uh, bone marrow sample and see how many cells actually are positive for CLL in the circulation. So if you have something like 10 to the minus four MRD positivity, that means one in every 10,000 cells is CLL related. This trial looked at whether patients have levels of 10 to the five or 10 to the six or less. And what was identified was that two months after treatment completion, 40% uh, of patients in the venetoclax arm versus 7% in the uh, chlorambucil arm had, un, uh, un, had um, MMRD levels of less than 10 to 10 to the six or 26% of less than 10 to the five, which is pretty impressive. We also recognize that patients must continue the full 12 cycles of venetoclax and rituximab therapy because MRD status or minimal residual disease status could actually still pick up the pace in the final six months of therapy with venetoclax and obinutuzumab therapy. The other update in ASH 2020 regarding upfront venetoclax and obinutuzumab is that on average, 74% of patients still had complete control and undetectable clinical CLL at 48 months. This is extremely impressive because it's the first time we've been able to see such outstanding CLL control for any combination of CLL drug. You can see the chlorambucil arm at 48 months, only 35% of patients had complete control of their disease at 48 months. Now in CLL, we're, now, we're seeing more and more combinations of drugs coming together. So we just saw venetoclax with an obinutuzumab, a monoclonal CD20 agent. What about if we comply, combined ibrutinib, a BTK inhibitor, with venetoclax, a BCL2 inhibitor? So this is abstract number 123 presented by Dr. Weirda, which is ibrutinib plus a venetoclax for first-line treatment of CLL or small lymphocytic lymphoma the one-year disease-free survival results from the uh, mineral, mineral residual disease cohort of the phase two Captivate trial. So what this trial looked at was comparing, uh, was actually combining a brutinib and venetoclax. Um, a couple of things to mention about venetoclax. Venetoclax is an oral pill, but if given on its own and not properly monitored, can actually result in serious complications of a thing called tumor lysis syndrome. This can actually kill patients um, if not properly managed because it can cause major alterations in potassium levels, uric acid levels, and kidney dysfunction. So in this trial, patients were actually given a brutinib for three cycles or three months upfront before venetoclax was actually introduced for 12 cycles with a brutinib to minimize this possible risk. Then patients were randomized based on their MRD status to either receiving a sugar pill, placebo, a brutinib, or if they did not have confirmed undetectable MRD status, a brutinib or a brutinib and venetoclax. The primary endpoint was looking at the one-year disease-free uh, disease survival rate in uh, undetectable MRD patients. And what can be seen in this phase two trial specifically, and I'm gonna point you down here because the rest of the, uh, the graphs can be difficult to read, is that for those patients that received 12 cycles of a of a brutinib and ongoing disease uh, or ongoing treatment with a brutinib, that 100% of them continued to have complete progression-free survival, um, meaning that their CLL was well controlled. There was no evidence of relapse of disease. Their lymphocytes were under good control. There was no palpable lymphadenopathy. They were really in check with their CLL. For those patients that did not have confirmed MRD status, we still had incredibly high progression-free survival rates at 30 months, showing us the incredible um, uh, combination and control of disease that these uh, medications can provide. Uh, the problem with these trials is that our patients are surviving so long now with these novel combinations 
that it's going to take years before we actually see any major changes in overall survival, which is a good problem. I'm going to switch gears now to another Brunton tyrosine kinase inhibitor that is new called Xanubrutinib. And I just put this up here just to show you that there are many BTK inhibitors coming down the pipeline. And this was presented by Dr. Brown. It's the Sequoia trial. Um, and essentially, patients who uh, did have 17P deletion, which is the most adverse cytogenetic abnormality, who were uh, over the age of 65, uh, were put on this 160 milligram twice per day pill. And what we see with this drug is that the overall response rate was 83%. Mind you, the actual results are quite premature and early, so we do wait for updated results from this. But this is meant to just show you that Xanabrutinib is likely another drug, if you're Googling away, that is coming down the pipeline in terms of another opportunity for CLL treatment. I'm going to switch gears now for second line uh, CLL treatment or relapse disease. So these are for patients who have been on first line therapy and are either progressing on therapy with new lymphocytes going up in the blood or new lymphadenopathy or something else changing in their health where we just see that there's a loss of control of their CLL treatment. Again, we look at comorbidities, fitness, whether patients have adverse cytogenetic features and also patient preference if they want to have a fixed duration of therapy or if they actually want are okay with being on something long-term. If patients have never received a Brunton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, we preferentially go to a BTK inhibitor right now, ibrutinib and acalabrutinib. I appreciate that in some parts of Canada, we do not have an opportunity to give venetoclax with obinutuzumab or rituximab. If patients are BTK intolerant, meaning they are actually having toxicity to one Brunton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, we often would switch the Brunton tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So if you're having side effects to a brutinib, your doctor may want to switch you to acalabrutinib. Other options include switching you to venetoclax or idolalacib. And to be honest, idolalacib is really not something that is, is routinely used anymore because of its toxicity profile and because of the uh, efficacy of the other drugs at our disposal. But let's say your, your Brunton tyrosine kinase is just not working at all. Then you need to talk to your doctor about either going on venetoclax with either rituximab or abinutuzumab. You can trial idolalacib and try to deal with the toxicities that may come or even a clinical trial. What we don't know though, is which drug is best for patients who have never received a Brunton tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And right now we have the CLL17 trial that is comparing acalabrutinib and abrutinib to see which of those two BTK inhibitors may actually be more beneficial with progression-free survival and also with control of toxicities. So we will not know those results probably for another couple of years. Updated at ASH was the ab abstract number 125, which is the five-year analysis of the Murano study, um, specifically looking at a population of relapsed or refractory CLL patients following a fixed duration of bonitoclax and rituximab therapy. So this trial looked at 389 patients that were randomized uh, who were relapsed or refractory, meaning they received either one to three prior therapies of CLL uh, treatment. And at least if one of them was bendamustine related, you must have had a progression-free survival lasting of greater than 24 months. Um, and these patients were randomized either to bendamustine, the dosing is showed there, or rituximab, or they were randomized the oral pill of venetoclax for two years with rituximab for six uh, infusions. Patients were category, categorized later according to minimal residual disease status using a threshold of 10 to the minus four rather than 10 to the minus five, meaning one in 10,000 10, 10, cells. So this trial uh, updated at ASH in 2020 really showed us how does venetoclax with rituximab after two years of therapy compare in the relapsed refractory CLL population. And what we could actually gain from this trial is that if given venetoclax and rituximab, on average, the median progression-free survival, meaning control of disease, was up to 53.6 months. So what this means for someone like myself is that if I have a patient who is going on second or third line therapy for CLL, I can tell them based on this trial that after two years of venetoclax and rituximab, we expect to have your disease controlled for about four and a half to five years. 
if I was to give them bendamustine and rituximab, disease control is only 17 months, which is only one and a half years. So I think most patients would want to opt for the drug combination that gives a very long control of disease status. The other thing that we learned from uh, the Murano trial presented this year at ASH is that even if patients had MRD negativity, but then started to convert months to years down the road, the MRD conversion predated progression of clinical symptoms by 19 to 24 months. So that actually gives us a lot of reassurance that even if patients start to show signs of CLL molecularly in the blood or through flow cytometry, we can still say that likely you won't need to be retreated or at least show signs of CLL for at least a year and a half to two years. Unfortunately, in Canada, we do not have access right now to MRD testing outside of clinical trials. Well, what's in the future for CLL treatment? Essentially, what if your agents do not control your CLL? Uh, so in this case, uh, ASH 2020 showed a new drug, which was presented previously, but much more focused this year, called LOXO305. And this is a novel non-covalent Brunton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which actually overcomes any resistance of binding to traditional BTK inhibitors, uh, specifically at the C481 mutation site. Dr. Matto uh, presented this, abstract 542 at ASH, and essentially uh, this is uh, an update of the phase one and phase two expansion uh, Bruin study, which looked not only at CLL patients, but also at indolent lymphoma patients. And 170 patient, or 140 patients approximately uh, have been randomized to this trial, essentially putting patients on this 200 milligram uh, per day pill for 28 day cycles. Um, dose escalation was allowed here, but uh, traditionally these patients um, uh, were either uh, in active need of therapy or had been previously treated with resistant disease. This is the waterfall plot presented at ASH this year. And you can see that with the waterfall plot that uh, the majority of patients had a 50% uh, reduction in disease burden. Um, whether they had no prior BTK inhibitor therapy or even prior BTK inhibitor therapy, which traditionally was with ibrutinib. So for those patients that look to be uh, ibrutinib resistant, this is the drug to actually get your hands on. The safety toxicity profile for this was very well tolerated, showed very good tolerability with few grade three toxicities, meaning when you have to go see a doctor, go to the emergency department, uh, a very small number of patients with fatigue, hypertension, and really a no, uh, low number of patients with diarrhea that was very well controlled. Um, so I've just given you a sampling of some of the CLL abstracts shown at ASH 2020. Um, there were hundreds of them, but it led us with uh, a, a, um, just a taste in our mouth of future questions in CLL that we have to consider. So a couple of things that we're looking forward to, which is the head-to-head -head trial of brutinib versus acalabrutinib in first and second line CLL, which is currently accruing. What we do know from retrospective data in the relapsed CLL population is that acalabrutinib looks to be just as equivalent as a brutinib, but we do await for these trials to come out and mature themselves. We are also looking at promising drugs, which overcome Brunton tyrosine kinase inhibitor resistance, such as LOXO305. We're also questioning how do we use minimal residual testing disease in CLL patients, particularly in Canada, because right now we feel that it will not change our overall management plan of ongoing active surveillance of our patients. And what gives us some reassurance is that MRD positivity conversion precludes clinical symptoms by up to 25 months. We do have a recognize from the data presented at ASH that those with 17P deletion or complex cytogenetics will progress likely faster. It's still unclear whether unmutated IGHV patients need more targeted agents versus uh, chemoimmunotherapy despite the clinical literature. And right now there are so many combinations coming down the pipeline that with limited time exposures, it's hard to know which combination is gonna be the big winner. 
In fact, when you look at all of the major drugs that we have right now in CLL, the oral pills, you can probably come up with 120 different clinical trials, all of which would take a long time to mature because CLL patients are living longer and longer on these drugs. I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about indolent not Hodgkin's lymphoma. So this is a, a, a background on follicular lymphoma. For those of you that may have follicular lymphoma or know someone who's been diagnosed with follicular lymphoma, first-line therapy right now is a drug called bendamustine, which is a purine analog with a monoclonal antibody called rituximab. It is based on a 2013 published trial already, the STILL trial, which actually showed a progression-free survival of 69.5 months over 31.2 months compared to RCHOP, but it does come with some toxicity, including a drop in blood counts. There have been other trials that have been published on first-line therapy for follicular lymphoma, including the PRIMA trial and the Gallium trial, and even in 2018, a trial called the RELEVANCE trial, which looked at an oral pill called Revlimid with rituximab and rituximab maintenance, but overall in Canada, we are still relying on bendamustine and rituximab as first-line therapy for follicular lymphoma. We also learned last year in 2019 at ASH that maintenance rituximab is a good thing for our patients and increases progression-free survival in most indolent lymphoma subtypes, except for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. So when your uh, patient practices or with your physician, if you have Waldenstrom's, you may actually not be offered rituximab maintenance. But the reason I show those background slides is because it's very difficult now with the new novel agency on the pipeline of how do we properly sequence therapy for follicular lymphoma. So traditionally for first-line therapy, as I mentioned, we give bendamustine and rituximab, but now we're faced with a challenge of what do we give in second line? Do we re-give bendamustine and rituximab do we actually try to give RCHOP, or do we actually try to give some of these novel agents, such as these oral inhibitors, like idilalacib, ibrutinib, clinical trials, or even possible CAR T-cell therapy? So options for relapse or refractory follicular lymphoma have been published with different agents, such as PI3 kinase inhibitors. These include idilalacib, uh, duvilacib and coconelacib, all with different two-year survival, overall survival rates that are published here, and different adverse toxicities. We're also now seeing more studies showing these agents called bispecific antibodies, which I'll talk about briefly, um, that are also showing excellent response rates considering how heavily pretreated these follicular lymphoma patients have been. And now coming down the pipeline are clinical trials looking at chimeric antigen receptor T-cells or CAR T-cell therapy, wherein overall response rates and complete response rates are at 95% and 81% respectively, but they do come with considerable toxicity. One of the trials that was pub or presented this year by Dr. Asseline in Montreal was Asterix 702. Uh, this is a bite cell therapy. It's monsonituzumab. Uh, in multiply relapsed follicular lymphoma patients um, in a phase one dose escalation trial. So essentially a bite cell or a bispecific T cell engager is actually a uh, molecule that attaches a T cell that traditionally kills bacteria to your CD20 positive lymphoma cell. And it essentially redirects T cells to engage and eliminate malignant B cells causing them to actually create this immune synapse formation and create a T cell attack on your B cell, killing it. So essentially, we're kind of recruiting your T cells to kill your cancer cells, but this can come with some toxicity. This is just an idea of the dosing strategies, the phase one trial where it's dose finding, given over a 15 day dosing schedule. Um, for patients that have had relapse refractory disease uh, follicular lymphoma. And essentially here, what can be seen is that in the 62 patients put in this trial, there was a 67% overall response rate with a complete response rate of 51% of patients. And even those patients that have, even though the sample size is small with four that had prior uh, CAR T cell therapy, 
there was at least a 100% partial response rate, which is pretty outstanding considering many of these patients would have been put under palliative care prior to this clinical trial. This trial, I believe, will be extending to many Canadian centres in the next few weeks to months. Toxicity-related side effects, however, um, do exist, so we have to watch for a thing called cytokine release syndrome, where patients get fevers, sweats, low blood pressure. Uh, many of them may actually head to the um, intensive care unit, and, uh, and it can be very scary for patients or families to watch. Um, but still, despite this outstanding literature that's being presented at our, at our conferences, there are still unmet needs in follicular lymphoma. Uh, specifically, should we actually be giving patients these toxic therapies, when particularly if patients have not received bendamustine, we do have good data that still bendamustine rituximab can give a very long progression-free survival of over three years. We also know that if patients have been given bendamustine rituximab and, uh, as first-line therapy, we don't really know which follicular lymphoma patients would be best managed with one treatment over another. Some should be treated with a rituximab or with rituximab and chemotherapy so long as they haven't progressed after 24 months or within 24 months. Some should be given CAR T cell therapy over others. Some should be preferentially given bite cell therapy. And some should be given things like abrutinib or revlimid or even idilalacid. We still don't have a good idea of which follicular lymphoma patients should be bucketed into which, key, which therapies at second, third, or fourth line. I'm going to briefly switch gears now and move to Waldenstrom's graphoglobulinemia. And this is a follow-up trial of the phase three trial of brutinib plus rituximab and Waldenstrom's for patients who uh, were either receiving this as first line or uh, second or third line therapy. Essentially, patients were randomized to receive abrutinib and rituximab versus placebo and rituximab. Uh, and this was originally published in 2016 with updates here at this year's ASH. What we do appreciate is that with the five-year follow-up, patients with abrutinib and rituximab overall have a median progression-free survival that has not been reached. And we are seeing this in our, in our, our, in our clinics that on average, patients put on abrutinib with Waldenstrom's can easily be on the drug for over four to five years as long as adverse toxicities are actually well controlled. Um, we do however appreciate that certain Waldenstrom's patients may do a little worse. Uh, and those are those with a CXCR4 mutation. Unfortunately, we do not have access to that mutational analysis here in Canada right now. But this is just to go that follow-up five-year data has shown us that abrutinib actually in second line therapy for Waldenstrom's in particular is actually a really good drug. So switching gears, and I, I, it's a whirlwind because I was asked to talk about lymphoma and there's a lot of lymphoma, um, is that I'm now gonna switch to high-grade lymphomas or diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And um, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is one of the lymphomas that actually we can cure with chemotherapy. And this uh, schematic here shows that tr the traditional standard of care is our CHOP-based chemotherapy. Our CHOP stands for rituximab with cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, vincristin or oncoborin, and prednisone. This is on your left-hand side. These are medications given intravenously, chemotherapy and immunotherapy. But now it seems that the playing field is changing a little bit. And particularly for those patients that are not cured with standard chemotherapy, we are now looking at a mechanism of disease control called CAR T-cell therapy, where a patient with relapsed or refractory lymphoma actually has their T-cells which are normally infection fighting cells removed from their body. They get shipped to a processing plant in the United States right now, if you're a Canadian. And there, those T cells are engineered to actually get reinfused 21 to 36 days later back into your body and preferentially attack CD19 positive cancerous lymphoma cells. The other therapy that's coming down the pipeline is the bispecific T cell engager, where we're actually developing molecules that are connecting your T cells to your lymphoma can cancer cells, where you're actually developing a cytokine killing of your lymphoma. So they're both different mechanisms of action, but sometimes very similar toxicities. 
Just a refresher that the treatment of first-line diffuse large B cell lymphoma is RCHOP-based chemotherapy, and this originally was published all the way back in 2002, and it still held the test of time. It should also be noticed that throughout the years, many therapies have been added to RCHOP without no that added benefit. These include RCHOP plus abrutinib, RCHOP plus revlimid. Unfortunately, we haven't seen much of a benefit in overall survival. There is a new trial coming down the pipeline with results hopefully coming in the next year or two called the Polarix trial, where polituzumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against CD79A, is actually being combined with RCHOP minus the vincristine versus RCHOP itself to see if this actually improves overall survival in first-line first diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And right now there are trials accruing acalabrutinib uh, a similar agent to abrutinib to RCHOP, again, to see if there is any survival advantage with this uh, 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 disease. So when we look at newly diagnosed diffuse large B cell lymphoma, approximately 60 to 65% of patients, pending on their international prognostic index score, uh, will actually be cured. But that means that about 35 to 40% of patients may actually relapse with disease. The traditional second line therapy for those under the age of 70 is to go for a thing called an autologous stem cell transplant. But still of those, 50% of them may not have good control of disease and only 40% may end up with a cure with the remainder relapsing. For those that are not eligible for a transplant or do not respond to salvage therapy, they are candidates for clinical trial or what I'm going to discuss in the next few slides is the CAR T cell results from this uh, past ASH. Now we know from previous literature in 2017 and 2019 that CAR T cell therapy actually works for diffuse large B cell lymphoma in patients that either cannot go for a transplant or relapse after a transplant. And what's been identified in follow-up literature is that the overall survival of patients given CAR T cell therapy who were relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma patients was 44%. Prior to this, the overall survival for patients was approximately four to six months. We also know that uh, now there are different CAR T cell um, products on the market. So one of them um, uh, uh, it was actually was studying the Zuma one trial, AxiCell, it's called, and then another trial, the Juliet trial, looked at another CAR T cell uh, agent, which I will have a very tough time uh, <laughs> pronouncing. But there was a 34% progression-free survival at 14 months, and the importance here is that it tells us that CAR T cell is a novel and effective means of treating relapse refractory uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. The thing, though, that we have to make sure of is that we control cytokine release syndrome, where patients actually are at risk of significant toxicity with fevers, low blood pressure, significant immune responses, um, respiratory distress, intubation, going to the ICU. It can be extraordinarily terrifying for patients and families, as I've mentioned before. And up to 10 to 20% of patients may have these significant toxicities, which are always being improved upon uh, with different pre-medications in future clinical trials and now going on on your wards and your, in your, um, in your uh, referral centers. Presented this year by Dr. Nilap, who uh, was abstract 405, which is the Zuma 12 updated trial. It's a multi-center phase two trial of AxiCell as part of first-line therapy in patients with high-risk lymphoma. So these are patients with large cell lymphoma, uh, uh, who actually uh, may have uh, abnormal cytogenetic abnormalities that portend a worse prognosis like MYC, BCL2 or BCL6 translocations, or they have uh, high IPI scores uh, before the time of enrollment. And essentially they received two cycles of RCHOP traditional chemotherapy. But if they actually had a positive PET scan after those two cycles of therapy, they were actually enrolled in this trial to receive uh, CAR T cell, uh, the CAR T cell axi cell. Uh, prior to getting axi cell, where you actually um, uh, receive the patient's T cells and then you process them, um, you do have to give a conditioning regimen to make sure 
uh, the body is able to accept the T cells and mitigate against um, uh, possible cytokine release syndrome. So that was with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. And overall, the primary endpoint was looking at the complete response rate, meaning no detectable cancer in the body. So what we see with Azuma-12 interim analysis for these patients with uncontrolled diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is that the overall response rate was 85%, with 74% of patients, meaning 20 of them in the trial, uh, having a complete remission status. This is after a median follow-up of 9.3 months only. So long-term data we still are waiting for to see how durable is this actual response. But it does tell us that for those patients who uh, uh, either cannot go for transplantation or progress on first-line therapy, that CAR T-cell therapy is an effective option for this limited time period that we have at our, at, to, to view. So overall, uh, what the take-home points for the Zuma-12 follow-up trial is that for those patients that had high-risk lymphoma that had a positive interim PET after two cycles of chemotherapy with high-risk disease, uh, we can control their disease in uh, uh, with a CR rate in 74% of patients, which really is actually outstanding considering a lot of these patients, unfortunately, would in the past have been palliated. Uh, right now, we uh, the literature supports that AxiCell is safe and effective in diffuse large piece of lymphoma, not responding to early frontline rituximab with chemotherapy. Uh, in Canada, it is uh, approved in third-line therapy. And right now, there is the Zuma-7 trial, which is looking at uh, patients receiving se uh, uh, autologous stem cell transplant versus uh, AxiCell and seeing if one is better than the other in second line uh, control of disease. A few words about bispecific T cell engagers now. So, we briefly talked about mosinituzumab and follicular lymphoma. Uh, there's also gliofitumab, and there are some others that were, were presented at ASH this past year. But as mentioned, these bite cells engage your T cells with your cancer cells and essentially stimulate your T cells to secrete cytotoxic granules, which essentially kill your lymphoma. One of the uh, bite cells presented was abstract 402 by Dr. Hutchings, uh, subcutaneous epcoritinib. Uh, Tamab, which actually looks uh, induced com complete responses in patients in the relapse refractory uh, high-grade B-cell lymphoma setting. Uh, this is just a schematic to show you that these dose-finding trials are very complicated and that bit by bit by bit, patients continue to have dose escalation as we try to mitigate against toxicity, but try to see which dose actually also continues to give a uh, treatment benefit. Um, Follicular lymphoma patients and diffuse starch B cell lymphoma patients were actually put into this trial. And what's important to note is that the, almost every diffuse starch B cell lymphoma patient, uh, or every single one of them, did receive RCHOP based chemotherapy and progressed on that. Overall response rates uh, with higher doses were as high as 91%, albeit the sample sizes are quite small. We also see uh, high response rates for patients with follicular lymphoma and mantle cell lymphoma. Another trial that was presented uh, is gliofitimab. Again, a dose escalation trial for patients with relapsed refractory non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And obinutuzumab in this case was given seven days prior to exposure to this bite therapy to avoid cytokine release syndrome. This is the overall demographic breakdown of our patients, with the majority of them being diffuse surge B cell lymphoma patients and having accelerated stage four disease. And overall, the response rates can be seen here as well. What we see is that the complete metabolic response rate was 62.5% in patients after three months of therapy, uh, or, or sorry, the overall response rate was 63% versus a 41% complete metabolic response rate. So again, this shows us that there are some very promising drugs coming down the pipeline uh, that um, clearly show effective killing advantage of our high-grade lymphomas um, with good control for the most part of toxicity. So in conclusion, I'm approaching five o'clock now. Um, ASH 2020 highlighted that the treatment of lymphomas continue to evolve. There are many targeted therapies going on. There are many new combinations. And much of this treatment now, particularly in high-grade lymphomas, 
uh, is diverted towards the manipulation of the immune system and relapse refractory disease. I should also stress that there is a no one size fits all approach right now. Uh, lymphoma and COL treatment is no longer black and white. We have to take into consideration our patients' comorbidities, uh, cytogenetic analyses, molecular features of the actual tumor biology, and also patient preference. But overall, with all of these novel agents coming down the pipeline and currently in clinical trial, it really does translate into improved overall life expectancies, which is extremely exciting. So with that, I'm able to take a few questions um, from the audience. And I, I must say that um, it's impossible to actually highlight everything that happened at ASH. So I can imagine some of you were hoping that I would speak about some other um, abstracts, but with such a limited time frame, I hope I gave you a brief sampling of what's to come and all the outstanding uh, literature that's going to be coming down the pipeline for all of you to um, participate in. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Trinkus. That was a really, really informative presentation. And as you mentioned, there are hundreds of lymphoma and CLL presentations and poster sessions at the past ASH conference. And we really thank you for summarizing a lot of these important studies um, and providing a detailed overview of what the important and relevant research topics is. If we wanted to try to get to every lymphoma subtype, I think we'd be here for about a day. So we really appreciate you summarizing this for, longer. for the feedback that we attended. <laughs> um, for those who have joined us live today, just a reminder that you still can type your questions into the control panel on your screen, and we'll, we'll try to get to all of them today. Um, we have quite a few to get started with. Um, so the first question is, you had mentioned that certain treatment options may not be an option for patients that are unfit. Is there a specific definition of what an unfit patient might be? Um, so this is specifically probably for CLL. So in the clinical trials, um, the German um, CLL study group, what they put together is a thing called a SEER score, which is a cumulative uh, illness rating score. And that's really been for the purpose of clinical trials to ensure consistency uh, between uh, cohort groups. And specifically, patients with this SEER score or uh, a cumulative illness rating score of greater than six are considered quote unquote unfit. And this score actually looks at everything from blood pressure control, diabetes control, uh, kidney performance, um, blood counts, um, uh, oxygen levels, ability to walk, like it looks at a bunch of 36 different parameters, I, I believe. Um, but, you know, in real life, when you actually look at a patient, physical fitness for us really boils down to how are your kidneys functioning? How is your liver functioning? Because some people do have, unfortunately, kidney disease and liver disease that prevents us from giving high doses of chemotherapy. And a lot of it also boils down to how far, it sounds very simple, how far can you actually walk? Are you able to live independently and shower independently? I know that sounds very, very frivolous to some people, but you have to imagine that the average age of CLL is 72. And a lot of our patients come in with many comorbidities, such as heart failure, arthritis, strokes, things that really prevent you from being physically agile or fit. And so giving someone a chemotherapy that may actually worsen those symptoms is a bad thing. So we really have to think about all of those parameters when we look at a patient, then we look at the toxicities of drugs to make sure we're picking the right sequence of medications at the right dose. And I, I'm not sure if I'm answering that fairly, but, but that it really is a discussion to have with your, with your physician. But a lot of it comes down to your blood work and also based on what we call your performance status, meaning how how robust of a patient or person you are. Okay, great. No, I think that was that was a great answer. Um, moving on to the next question. Uh, one of your last points when you were summarizing the CLL treatments was that it was unclear if unmutated IGHB patients need targeted agents versus novel agents through clinical trials. Um, and options maybe now for patients have been known to include BTK inhibitors or venetoclax for unmutated IGHV. Is, is this still true? And kind of what are your thoughts moving forward on that? Yeah, so um, based on the literature, what, what, uh, what we can say right now is that for unmutated BTK inhibitors or sort of unmutated IGHV status, you really should be, based on what we have right now, it is suggestive that BTK inhibitors are actually in favor over chemoimmunotherapy. So if you do have an unmutated IGHV status with your CLL, 
your doctor will probably 99% of the time put you on a brutinib or a calibrutinib right now. For first-line venetoclax, in many parts of Canada, that is actually still not funded, um, you know, um, despite the CLL-14 trial data. So if you have good insurance, then your doctor can look into that because that is a fixed 12-month duration of chemoimmunotherapy. But if you do not have insurance, um, for a lot of Canadians, that's actually not a possibility. Um, okay. Yeah, so so it would be one of those two options in my mind outside of clinical trial, which there are many clinical trials right now. Great, wonderful to hear. Um, we probably have time for maybe a couple more questions, if that's okay. Um, the question, the next question is on: Do you expect the toxicity of CAR T for follicular non-Hodgkin's lymphoma to be improved as this therapy is a bit more refined, perhaps? Yeah. Um, uh, definitely. So uh, there are specific sites across Canada that are only doing CAR T cell therapy. You're not going to find this in your community centers at all. Um, and um, as we actually get more and more patients through CAR T cell therapy, we're actually learning how to properly premedicate our patients um, prior to and actually during the actual infusion itself. So I didn't I didn't talk about this at all, but protocols are always being improved upon. And one of the drugs that we're actually giving to uh, quiet down the significant cytokine release syndrome is called tocilizumab, it's an IL-6 inhibitor. And um, we are getting much, much better at uh, predicting toxicity so that we can give this preemptively ahead of time. The other thing that we're learning a lot better is how to give steroids to our patients in anticipation of uh, cytokine release syndrome. And in the past, we were really nervous to give steroids to our patients because we thought, oh dear, steroids are gonna kill off the T cells that we're just infusing, and that actually doesn't seem to be the case. So we are giving a lot of preventative medications to mitigate against toxicity. So um, CRS is definitely becoming much, much more manageable even compared to a year ago. Like a lot of centers are becoming much more comfortable with uh, managing toxicities. That's a really great to hear um, and, and great news kind of moving forward in that CAR T space for, for newer indications as well. Um, another question is just related to uh, a specific therapy, but I think this can be across all the different clinical trials and therapies that you presented today. Um, how long does it really take to get from this research result that you presented to actually having an accessible treatment in Canada? Um, is there, could you say, could you put an estimated timeline on it? Could it be four to five years? Could it be longer or shorter? Okay, this is a really, this is an interesting question. Um, so uh, to actually get drug approval in Canada, it actually has to go through a lot of regimented um, drug review boards, um, which are composed of physicians, statisticians, um, pharmacists, a bunch of people. And uh, it does take time to actually go through that process to make sure that both from a physical uh, safe patient perspective standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint, that this is a viable good thing to do in a socialist country. Um, some things, some drugs, like a brutinib, for instance, when the trial data came out for a brutinib in 2016, it was irrefutable that the data was so strong, this was actually unethical to hold back from our patient population. That was approved within weeks of publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, the other medications coming out of the pipeline, because of brut I'm going to talk about CLL, has been so uh, strong. It's it's taken a little bit longer to approve to get drug access and approval. I'll be honest, and um, and uh, but we're still pushing hard. And um, uh, and I would say it, it it takes on average about one to two years. We're not like the Americans, which takes six weeks. Um, but that's because a lot of their healthcare is actually privately funded. Um, so we do have a lot more red tape. Um, but but things are moving a lot faster, and that's because the results are just so. Uh, they're actually so compelling that uh, they cannot be ignored. So I, I don't think I answer that properly, but it's getting better. I will say it's definitely getting better. And CAR T cell therapy, if you're wondering when that'll be like prime time, fully approved outside of clinical trials or whatnot, you know, CAR T cell actually is about $500,000 per treatment. So it's not willy nilly um, spare change. So that actually is going to take a little bit longer time for approval. Uh, be, to become standard of line prime time. And, um, you know, our, our approval processes will really wait for mature data before we actually can jump, 
jump in and say that this is this is approved for everybody's use. That's wonderful. Thank you. It, and it's exciting to see how these therapies are coming to Canada. And like you mentioned, we're hoping it'll be a quicker process with some of these exciting uh, options for patients. Um, we're just about running out of time. So I just really wanted to ask a very quick question, if you could touch on just how exactly bi-specific antibodies work in the body and, you know, why they're such an exciting new treatment option or for patients. Yeah, so bispecific antibodies, so they actually have two different attachment sites, one that actually attaches on to the cancer cell and one that actually attaches on to a T cell. And the moment these this uh, bispecific engager attaches to both cells, it actually stimulates a response in the T cell. It stimulates it to actually program it to think that that cancer cell is bacteria or a bad guy. And really what it does is it actually causes the T cell to spit out all of its cytokines and actually cause a, an antibody-dependent cytotox cellular toxicity. So it, it literally is like spitting bullets at your at your cancer cell. Um, it's a very targeted therapy, and you know, and we have to appreciate that 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 target on the actual T cell engager is very specific for a B cell lymphoma cell. Mm -hmm. However, not only does it kill the malignant B cell, it can also it will also target the healthy B cells. So that's why we have to also think about long-term toxicity because we, we, we are actually wiping out the normal immune system of our patients as well. And so with this, we have to think about vaccinations, that we have to revaccinate our patients, we have to put them on prophylactic antibiotics, but we also have to put a lot of them on intravenous immunoglobulin because all of a sudden they're not able to make normal antibodies anymore. So you're getting great results with killing your cancer, but you're also getting these secondary possible infectious toxicities. Okay, Noah, that's great. And thank you for providing a bit more information about that. And it helps to just give a bit of a background on those new therapies that are coming out as well. So uh, I wanted to take a moment to thank everyone for their questions. We had quite a few. So for those that we weren't able to answer, we will try to follow up uh, offline. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Martina Trinkus for taking the time to thoroughly share your expertise and knowledge on all the presentations, uh, topics, and exciting new things that were presented at the ASH conference. And I want to thank everyone as well who uh, attended the audience live. Um, as a reminder, we will be posting this presentation on our website to use as a resource. So please feel free to watch it again if there was something you missed or if you would like to share this information uh, with others who were unable to join. You will also be sent an email later this evening with the link to be able to access and watch the recording. So we hope you learned a lot from this presentation and continue to use Lymphoma Canada as a resource for education and support. And you can watch the recording of all of our webinars on our website and access different educational forums as well through the research resource tab. As a final thank you, we greatly appreciate your time and expertise, um, Dr. Trinkus, and thank you greatly for sharing these exciting research updates with the lymphoma community from across Canada. Um, thank you as well to our audience who attended live today and thank you for asking questions. Thank you everyone for joining today. I hope you have a wonderful evening and stay safe. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye.